Welcome. For a while after graduation, I worked in the Human Performance Laboratory for a famous shoe company. From time to time, film crews would show up with several people and take three or four hours to gather the material they needed for a three or four minute segment on the news that evening. Whenever you're trying to present a lot of information in a compact space or a compact period of time, it takes planning and forethought and not everything that you've done appears in the final product. The same is true for a complex physics problem. As you organize your thoughts, make a plan in order to present a correct and clear presentation to your instructor, you might not end up including everything that you have initially thought of and you may even start over a couple of times. That's okay, that's academic maturity. You are working with multi-step difficult problems at this point and I don't want you to be discouraged by that process. I'm Dr. Courtney. This problem is essentially an inelastic collision, except rather than translational motion, we have rotational motion in this problem. So the big idea is to use conservation of angular momentum which we'll designate by the capital letter L with a vector symbol over it because it's a vector quantity. We're going to use that to find the final speed of both disks, which act as a unit at the end. We're told that we can ignore the radius and that there's no friction on the shaft on which the disks are centered, and it's also important that no external forces are acting in the plane of rotation. That's how we can use the conservation of angular momentum. Now vertically, the force of gravity is acting and that is what makes the first disc drop onto the second disc, but we are not asked anything about that uh, dimension. And so even though that's true, it doesn't come into play. As we develop our problem, we have an initial state in which the smaller disk is above the larger disk. We'll designate that mass 1 and give it a designation of omega 1 for its initial speed, its initial angular speed. The lower disk is larger, and we will call its initial angular speed omega 2 and designate it as mass 2. In the final state, we still have the larger disk on the bottom, but the smaller disk has now dropped onto it, and the two are rotating as a single unit. The final angular speed we will designate as omega final. Now we're given several things in this problem. We're given masses, which we want to express as kilograms, radii, which we want to express in meters. We are interested in the initial and final velocities, so omega uh, initial and omega final. And so let's track those for later use for mass 1 and mass 2. Mass 1 is given to us as 250 grams, so that's 0 0.250 kilograms. The radius is 0 0.021 meters. Its initial speed is zero. The units we're interested in there are radians per second. And we do not know the final angular speed, so we'll designate that omega final. For mass 2, we have a mass of 420 grams or 0 0.420 kilograms. The radius is 0 0.032 meters. Its initial speed is not zero. So omega-2, we're told it's rotating at 150 revolutions per minute. We need to convert that, it becomes 15.70 radians per second. And at this point in the course, I will leave that computation to you. We do not know the final speed of disk 2 either, but we do know it's the same. As we make a plan to solve this problem, we want to... Um, Equate the initial and final momenta
different, but we need to then express those. Uh, so that's L initial and L final. We need to express those in terms of moments of inertia. So that would be a moment of inertia of disc one and disc two, and omega one, omega two, and omega final, the three angular speeds that we're interested in. We are not given the values for the moments of inertia, and so we need to express the moments of inertia in terms of masses m1, m2, and the radii r1 and r2. Then we can substitute values. Actually, then we will need to uh, solve it symbolically for the final speed. Then we'll be ready to substitute values and compute that final speed, omega final. We have another part of this problem where we're asked how much of the initial kinetic energy is lost to friction in this process. And so our plan for that, I'm actually going to put that plan over here since we have some space for it, to find the kinetic energy lost, we, are we can express that as the total initial kinetic energy, which we'll call 1, since we're looking for a fraction lost, minus what we're able to compute is the final kinetic energy. And if we take that over the initial kinetic energy, this will be the fraction of kinetic energy we have left. So subtracting it from 1 will give us the fraction of kinetic energy that was lost to friction. And so to do that, we'll need to express kinetic energy in terms of things that we know, very similar to part one. So eventually we have to get to mass one, mass two, radius one, radius two, and the initial speeds and final speed. So we're ready to evaluate this problem. In part A, we're going to equate the initial and final angular velocities. The initial angular velocity consists of the angular velocity of disk 1 and the angular velocity of disk 2. The final angular momentum is equal to the sum of the moments of inertia times the final speed because the two disks are acting as a single unit and they share an axis of rotation. Recall that the initial angular speed of disk 1 is 0, and so that term can go to 0. The angular uh, moment of inertia for a disk is expressed as 1 half the mass times the radius squared. And so we have 1 half mass 2 radius 2 squared times its initial speed. And similarly... those moments of inertia times the final speed. Now this is what we're looking for, the final speed. So as we isolate for that, we notice we can cancel out a term of one half throughout the equation, and we get the final speed is equal to the second mass times its radius squared times its initial speed over the moments of inertia well, not exactly, since we took out the one-half. So we have those two terms left after we take out the one-half times, oops, that's what we wanted to isolate. So this is not a difficult computation, but it does involve a lot of numbers, and so I will leave that substitution to you with the proviso that you include your units. So sub-values include units that will prevent you from making unit mistakes and from forgetting a term. And then we come up with a figure for omega final that is 12.419 radians per second. And so the final speed is to two significant figures, 12 radians per second. Now we can 
uh, evaluate part two of the problem to find the kinetic energy lost. And so the kinetic energy lost can be expressed as 1 minus the fraction of kinetic energy we have left. The kinetic energy is the angular velocity of the final, so that's I1 plus I2 times the final velocity squared divided by the initial kinetic energy, which, as you recall, only came from disk 2. And so we have the moment of inertia for disk 2 times its initial speed squared. Similar to part 1, or part A, we will substitute... I'm sorry, these have terms of 1 half. It's 1 half I omega squared. But those can cancel. And then we have uh, 1 minus... Again, we need to substitute for those moments of inertia. And we have yet another factor of one-half that comes from the moments of inertia that we can cancel. And then we can express um, this kinetic energy loss is already what we're looking for. So we don't have to do further work to isolate it. And I will let you substitute the values again with units. Now these units should all cancel out because the fraction of kinetic energy loss should be a unitless quantity. And we find that it is 1 minus 0 0.7 and we find that it is 1 minus 0 0.7905 which means that the kinetic energy lost is 0.21 times the initial kinetic energy, or you could say that it lost 21%, although this problem asked for a fractional amount. How can we determine whether our answers make sense? First of all, unit analysis. So you could go back and double check that in your substitution for part A, you do end up with radians per second after canceling the units, and that in part B, you end up with no units at all. and radians per second. What about the magnitude? Well, let's think about translational momentum for a moment. If you recall, if you have two masses, one is stationary, one is coming in in one dimension, they have an inelastic collision and continue in the same direction, that the final speed, if the two masses are equal, will be one half of the initial speed of the mass that was moving. So we can use that as a gauge for this problem. If that were to happen, if both masses had the same radius and the same mass, we would expect the final angular speed to be about half. However, the mass of disk 1 is less and the radius is less than that of disk 2. Therefore, we expect that omega final will be less than the initial speed of just disk 2. But how much less? Well, by the argument we just made, we expect that it's going to be greater than half of omega 2. And so we can use these to bound the solution that is calculated in part A. And so by checking units and bounding our answer, you can develop confidence that your answer is correct.